Now that you've had a chance to read this difficult and challenging road trip, uh, let's look at it together uh, to see some of the ways that Marilyn Robinson's Gilead uh, uses storytelling and uses her fictive narrative to investigate uh, this peculiar challenge of what's it mean to love in a family and how does that work and what does family love look like? So this is a pretty tricky um, passage because of all the people and all the time and all the chronology. And it's worth taking a few seconds to, to sort these things out. This is really another example of a difficulty. The image is complex and a lot of the backstory is complex. But you remember, John Ames is 76 years old. He's about to die. He's writing letters to a six-year-old son, telling him all about life. And this is one of these letters. And this letter starts, he says, when I was 12 years old, my father took me on a road trip. Okay, so uh, John Ames, the narrator, is 76 years old, and this is set in 1956. The son, the child, is six years old. Now, interestingly enough, he named his son after himself, but it turns out that he himself was named after his father, John Ames, who himself was also named after his father, John Ames. As if this family name, my sons have um, a Hughes family name, they share the, the surname, but here they wanted both, as if all the generations were echoing out through the people, connecting them uh, in an interesting way, how powerful names are. We know about names in one tradition, in the namesake. Now we're seeing it again played out in another fashion. So John Ames was 12 years old in the story and on a trip with his father, who it turns out was also named John Ames. And this father in the story is going to visit the grave of his father, who is also named John Ames. So it turns out this, this dead man is John Ames the first. This is John Ames Jr. Our narrator is actually John Ames the third, and the son will be John Ames the fourth. So he's 12 years old. It's it he would have it would have been 1892, would have been the year of this road trip. And um, they're going to see the grave of this old man. And this old man was, in the 1830s, was a Christian pastor. In fact, he was a Christian missionary to the frontiersmen of the wild, wild west. 1830s, there's Native Americans on the plains. 1830s, the, the Transcontinental Railroad has not yet been made. We're talking covered wagons. We're talking gold miners, prostitutes, escaped slaves, poor people of all kinds of dimensions going west to find their fortune, going west to find land and to somehow that great pioneer spirit that was noble in some stories, but also incredibly immoral and corrupt. Survival skills, all kinds of horrors happening. Blood and death and gore and alcohol and, and, and all kinds of icky stuff. And this Christian missionary, John the Baptist figure, took his Bible, went out, he was wildly evangelical, trying to save souls left and right. He was an abolitionist. He um, hated slavery. He was preaching abolition, the freedom of slaves. He thought it was an evil. I thought it was an evil too. Most of us now think of it as an evil. He was radical Christian and he believed in the Civil War. He was pro-Civil War because he believed it was a wholly just war being fought to, to rid the world of the sin of slavery. He was a pro-war, Christian, abolitionist, wild man. His son, it turns out, 
was also a Christian pastor, but he was a pacifist. And I tell you that because this was the reason of the fight. There was a fight between these two, and the fight was about war. Can you be a Christian and support a war? Um, Grandpa, father did, thought no. Second thought, excuse me. John Ames the first believed in a just holy war, the civil war to free the slaves. John Ames Jr. thought it was wrong. You cannot, he was the Prince of Peace, Jesus. You cannot, you must be a make peace. You must reconcile, find other ways to rid slavery. You can't do it from war. That's a violation of his fundamental Christian faith. Who was right? They both are. Both are legitimate interpretations of Christian doctrine, but they fought about it. They fought about it fiercely, and this guy died in the midst of the fight. That's the backdrop to this road trip. So what happens is, well, our narrator, John Ames, is telling the story of what happens. He's telling the story. 76-year-old man tells a story about when he was 12 to his six-year-old son. Well, back in the day, son, my father and I went on a road trip to look at, the, to, to pray at the grave of my grandfather, your great-grandfather. What happens? Well, you guys read the story. A whole bunch of stuff happens. They walked. Can you imagine in 1892 walking across the prairie? Like, what the heck? No very few roads, no highways, no electricity, no plumbing, no food, no rest stops. They almost starved to death. They, 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 they survived largely based on the generosity of, of strangers who believed if you eat a stranger, you give them water, give them food, share what you have so they can survive. Uh, there, by the way, there's a Christian doctrine of, of, um, of hospitality. There's a, a wonderful Muslim, wonderful Muslim doctrine of generosity. You welcome strangers. They could be so, we welcome pilgrims. We welcome, we feed, we share. The, the great religious traditions have this as part of the teaching. Uh, all right, okay, so we hear that story, the gross carrot, they nearly starve, some lady helped them, and then they finally get to the graveyard, they spend all day cleaning it up, and then at the end of the day, the dad kneels down before the grave and prays to his dead father. He asks a prayer, a long, quiet, serious prayer asking for forgiveness. And the son, who's now 12, the narrator when he was 12 year old, stands there and listens because he knows you got to respect a man, you respect our elders, and when daddy's praying, don't interrupt him. Prayer is serious. Leave people alone. It's silent. Except for the fact that at that time, um, out on the horizon, in the prairie, the sun is setting. And the moon is rising. And the little boy's looking around trying to be, um, trying to be polite. And he's watching the sun set after a hard day's work. And it's beautiful, but there's a moment when as the sun sets, and as the moon rises, there's a moment where there seems to be bands of light jumping across each other, jumping, connecting the rising new night with the setting old sun. One generation is dying, another generation is rising and there's this miraculous thing in the heavens and the boy sees this and it's amazing and it's beautiful and he doesn't know what to do he can't interrupt dad he can't talk about him he can't say hey dad look that would be disrespectful that would be a violation of prayer so what's he do he reaches over and he grabs his dad's hand and he kisses it and the father deep in prayer looks up and sees the heaven display, the celestial explosion of light and connection to him. 
The kid thinks it's beautiful, but a Christian believing prayerful man who's praying for forgiveness looks up in the heavens and sees this. How can that not be experienced as a response to his prayer? How can that not be, oh my gosh, the heavens, my prayer is being heard. It's as if, and it's not as if, as if his dead grandfather is saying, I hear you. It's as if God in the spirit is saying, yes, thank you. We are, are reconciled. We are forgiven. Pretty cool image pretty complex image and you can see in it all the different levels the three levels of course there's natural beauty or the power the majesty the the celebration of creation John Ames wants his son to know the world is God's gift to you enjoy its beauty take pleasure in its bounty there's a really interesting kind of lesson about relationship. Well, first, he's teaching his son about being respectful. Respect your elders. Don't interrupt them when they're praying. I didn't. You shouldn't either. It's a little technical family, uh, uh, family level of manners. But guess what? Manners have to be taught. We, they, we don't grow up with manners. Our parents, our family, our culture teaches this to them. So it's about the relationship of prayer. But it's also about a much bigger relationship. The relationship of forgiveness in families. This has been a, a rough rupture. There's a broken relationship. That dad died. The abolitionist holy war guy and his son wasn't speaking to him. What a horrible thing. Well, the relationship lesson is we families have to reconcile. Families must ask for forgiveness. You just in your family, people have fought. People have feuded. People have disagreed with goodwill with all their hearts. And when that happens, you have the responsibility to reconcile. Okay. There's a lesson about reconciling with family. And then, last but not least, there's a theological lesson about prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Da -da 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 -da. Uh, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. That's the Christian's Lord prayer. Every Christian knows some form of it. And in that devotion of Christian faith, there's the the notion that God forgives us, but that we have responsibility to forgive others, even our family, even those we disagree with. And so there is this, A, this lesson about forgiveness, and there's also a lesson about prayer as an important, real thing within the Christian experience. And there's even one more lesson I think that's even more important is that this man is talking to a six-year-old. This man is about to be dead. He's crossing the boundary of life to death. He's, he's, he's about to, quote, put on imperishability. He's about to go to heaven. And that boy will live a life for all these next years without a dad physically present in his life. But he's teaching him with this story, guess what, dude, you can pray. You can pray to me. You can speak to me through prayer. That's how powerful prayer is. Prayer lets us transcend the boundary of life and death. And I will be with you as a spirit. I will be looking down at you from heaven. And you can be with me and feel my presence by praying across using your Christian faith to pray. And I will be with you just as my father prayed to be with and ask for forgiveness of his father. What a great and powerful loving lesson to give to a kid who you're not going to be able to be with soon. Three things, nature, relationship, and theology crammed in to every little thought bubble, every little story. You may, uh, it's brilliant once you tease it out. It's hard to do so. And those of you who think this is a worthwhile dimension of love to think about in your own life, in your own work, 
Well, here's a great text to use, a great text to use to talk about family love, to talk about forgiveness, to talk about faith, loving God, or how faith love manifests itself within a family culture, within a family experience. Great read, hard read, but look what you guys can do. Look, look what you can figure out at the end of the semester. I'm thinking about my family a lot. I don't, I don't know if this works this way, right? Um, uh, my mom and my dad are past. I was very close to my mom. All gay men love their moms. Um, but, and I miss her a lot. You know, it's been years now and I miss her a lot. And especially at different moments. Thanksgiving is one of them. I, I, she, I feel close to her when I'm making some of her recipes or, or, uh, you know, uh, making homemade soup the way she makes it, making the rhubarb cake the way she makes it, um, birthday parties, how they were celebrated, all these family cultural things I feel, I remember, I, I, I have this melancholy sweetness about uh, my mom and her love and, and I miss her, her absence. And, um, but I don't know that I pray to her and talk to her in my prayers like these guys do, but I do, I do hold her in my heart and I do feel a presence and I do look to her. I don't, I don't go to a funeral. I don't put flowers on her grave. I remember her birthday and I make a peach pie. Um, but, but, um, so I don't know that it exactly works like this, but, but I do think there's a presence of people who've died in our lives. There's, there's rituals, there's ways of holding them in our hearts and making them present. I, I, this great thing happened. Um, we had this great, pink box of candy from a local chocolate maker in Rochester where I grew up. And uh, at the kids' wedding in Alaska last week, I, I got my act together and I sent them a great big box, two pound box of this incredibly delicious, you know, chocolate. And, and I sent the note, the note was of course, you know, thinking of you on your wedding day, much love, Grandma Flo. And Grandma Flo's dead. So I know that Smart Son and the lovely, um, the lovely lady Penny that he married, they know she's dead, but how cute to to get this sign of her, of her family, of our family. And the, it was great. They were so wonderful. The pink box was there the whole wedding. It came out every meal. At breakfast, we were having we were having breakfast chocolates. <laughs> Who has chocolate at breakfast? But um, but they were so gracious about you know this little pink grandma flow box. She was present, not perhaps in prayer, but in chocolate. So so that. That may be how it plays out in my life. I don't know. I don't know how you feel the presence of, um, of your ancestors or your family that have gone or how you will in the future. But what a great thing to read about it, uh, as, it as it has worked in this text. Okay, have fun with those lit journals. Uh, we'll talk about the final projects uh, next week.